Thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today. In our time together, I hope to share with you our journey and experience implementing collaborative care here at Beth Israel Lakey Health, and to be able to speak to some of the challenges and opportunities that come along with implementing collaborative care. I don't have any relative disclosures, uh, and these are a brief summary of the objectives I hope we're able to accomplish uh, in today's discussion. Overall, we're here to talk about the treatment of mental health disorders in the primary care space. And before starting, we should understand what those burdens are in primary care and why we would think differently about treatments in that particular setting. These are data from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation from the University of Washington and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's based on the most recent global survey from 188 countries around the globe. The metric we're going to look at is disability adjusted life years, which is years lived with the disability plus years of life lost to premature mortality. And it's a useful measure of chronic disease of which mental health disorders are a significant burden of chronic illness. And here to orient you on the slide, uh, each color indicates a broad cause of disease. Blue are non-communicable diseases, red are communicable diseases, and green are injuries. And I've highlighted those mental disorders here in those boxes, which account for roughly 20% of the total global burden of disease. These are those same global data, but evaluated by Whiteford and colleagues. And they're looking at disability adjusted life years across the lifespan. First, we see that depressive disorders accounted for the most disability adjusted life years, followed by anxiety disorders, drug use disorders, and alcohol use disorders. You all see that these are most striking in adulthood where individuals are typically their most productive, essentially striking down individuals in their prime. The same group also looked at the change over time and found that though increasing year over year, it's mostly attributable to population growth and aging. However, an expected rise in life expectancy will result in more people living with mental and substance use disorders for a longer period of time, and thus requiring more resources and new systems to care for these individuals. Disability from a chronic illness, including mental disorders, takes its toll. And these are data from the World Economic Forum and the Harvard School of Public Health that compare mental health to other chronic conditions. Mental illness tops the list, beating out cardiovascular disease and accounting for more than diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, and cancer combined. The largest driver of these costs are due to the impact on output from lost productivity due to illness. Despite knowing the physical, economic, and social tolls of mental disorders in our communities, countries and communities have not made significant contributions to bend this curve. And you can see here the relative lack of investment and thus lack of services, especially around prevention of mental disorders and suicide services. It's not just investment in services, but the human capital that's needed to treat individuals in need. Less than 1% of the global healthcare workforce works in mental health. And moreover, that workforce is not equally distributed with 45% of the world's population living in a country with less than one psychiatrist per 100,000 people. So what are we facing as we think about what we're here to tackle? We understand that depression and anxiety disorders cost over a trillion dollars annually. There's over 800 suicide deaths per year. It remains significantly common and a burden in vulnerable populations around the globe that treatment coverage remains low, that there's a lack of sustainable financing and support for these interventions, and that the ability to scale interventions to meet a global need continues to be lacking. But despite those challenges, there may be opportunities. And first, as you're here today, we must all agree that there is no health without mental health. We cannot separate the mind and body, and we frankly can't split our patients in half that team-based coordinated care that addresses the mental and physical health needs of patients will allow comprehensive, accessible, and holistic care. It is cost-effective and more efficiently meets individual patients' needs. It will provide an opportunity for psychological help and support at an earlier stage of disease, helping to secure improvements in both physical and mental health and wellness over a lifetime. And fundamentally, it drives better health outcomes for our patients in need. 
And so this is really what awaits us as we kind of begin this journey of thinking about how to integrate mental health care into the primary care space. So if whole person care is the goal, then our question should be, how are we actually able to achieve it? Data tell us that the majority of individuals who are identified with a mental health condition receive that care in the primary care setting. And so what does primary care already do? And in the primary care space, we see that less than half of the patients needing care ever receive treatment. 20 to 40% of primary care patients have an identified behavioral health care need. The depression goes untreated in 60% of those cases. 75% of patients with depression see their primary care providers, so they're interacting with a care provider. There is opportunity to treat and make interventions. In the U.S., up to 80% of antidepressants are actually prescribed by primary care physicians. That's their primary mode of intervention and treatment. But only 20 to 40% of patients will improve substantially in six months without any form of specialty assistance. So we see that more patients are seen in the primary care setting and more prescriptions for antidepressants are given there. However, fewer patients complete an adequate trial of treatment and the treatment modalities are generally limited to medications alone. And so out of this environment of separate care between primary care and specialty psychiatric care came collaborative care. And many here in the audience are probably already familiar with this seminal study and the introduction of co the collaborative care model. So this is an early large trial, it's called the impact study of collaborative care. And it compared collaborative care to treatment as usual in older adults with depression in the primary care setting. So this occurred in the US, it was in eight healthcare organizations across five states. They enrolled and randomized 1800 patients into the trial. Patients were identified with depression, uh, they were then randomized to either receive the intervention of collaborative care, which would include their primary care provider, a depression care manager who would deliver brief psychotherapeutic interventions in the primary care space and be supervised by a consulting psychiatrist that would support antidepressant management by the patient's primary care physician, or they would receive treatment as usual. At the end of 12 months, as compared to treatment as usual, collaborative care was associated with the significantly greater improvements in their depression, their function, and their quality of life. And since this study's publication almost 20 years ago, there have been over 100 additional randomized controlled trials supporting the use of collaborative care in managing depression and anxiety in the primary care setting. Here's a graphic that may better uh, describe and help understand what it actually looks like in a practice. So there are the typical dyadic relationship between the PCP and the patient. You can see that that direct communication by those dark arrows. However, there are new team members in the treatment team and you can see them in that green oval. And that's the behavioral health provider or partner and care manager and the consulting psychiatrist. The behavioral health partner is typically physically located in the practice, while the consulting psychiatrist is typically outside of the practice. What's also helpful to understand about this particular model of care and what's helpful in this graphic is that it also represents that not all patients with a psychiatric illness can be managed within the collaborative care framework. And for those patients that are engaged in collaborative care but do not improve and may need to have their care escalated, the role of the behavioral health partner is often to facilitate this transition from primary care into specialty psychiatric care to help avoid individuals dropping out of care and losing whatever progress they may have made. Collaborative care delivers an evidence-based psychotherapeutic intervention that is specifically designed for delivery within the primary care setting. These are often problem-oriented, solution-focused type work that's going to promote rapid recovery in an individual. And these are data from another large health system. This is, they looked back retrospectively around 7,000 patients over a five-year time frame of individuals engaged in collaborative care and compared that to treatment as usual. And you can see here that there was a significant reduction in the time of improvement in collaborative care, such that individuals engaged, engaged in collaborative care 
got better in about three months versus those in treatment as usual, almost two years. And considering the typical length of an untreated episode of major depression, in this study, treatment as usual looked a lot like no treatment at all. As I'd mentioned, there have been over 100 randomized controlled trials to date that have looked at collaborative care and its interventions. This is an older Cochrane review that at that time looked at 79 different randomized controlled trials that involved over 24,000 patients receiving collaborative care for depression and anxiety. The authors found that collaborative care had significantly greater effects in the short, medium, and long term as compared to control conditions, and that these collaborative care interventions also appeared to provide benefit on mental quality of life, medication use and adherence, and overall satisfaction with care and physical health related quality of life. Here in our health system at Beth Israel Leahy Health, we've chosen to engage in collaborative care, not by chance, but because the evidence really implores us to do so. It helps us to achieve the triple and quadruple aims of healthcare, and that collaborative care is a specific form of integrated healthcare. The core components that distinguish collaborative care are that it is a primary care-led, patient-centered, team-based approach to care that is population-focused, tracking populations over time, using measurement-based treatments to target that improvement, and that we are going to continuously deliver evidence-based treatments and ultimately be accountable to patients, to providers, and to payers. And we know that collaborative care is an evidence-based, cost-effective, and high-quality care delivery model. So the question is, why aren't more people doing it? And it's probably for many of the same common reasons that change is hard in healthcare. Moreover, despite a robust evidence base and clear definition, there remains no agreed upon right way to implement collaborative care. So depending on the size and scope of your practice or your network or your healthcare system, the culture of collaboration and the resources to affect that change all of those will impact the ability to make a successful transformation and or successfully implement collaborative care. And so here I'll look to share our own experience at Beth Israel Leahy Health in our journey to broadly implement collaborative care across a wide network of primary care practices here in Massachusetts and really use this as a case study to understand where there are some challenges and where opportunities may exist to create a successful implementation process. The first challenge, and often the hardest, is tackling culture. So here are the models of different types of collaboration that anyone currently uses, all the way from traditional consultation in private offices to co-localized non-integrated care, where a provider may be living in the primary care space and see a patient there, but their care is completely separate from that of the primary care provider. And lastly on the arrow, you see where we really are headed to is to full collaborative care with all the components that we discussed. And many of these core elements that make collaborative care successful are going to require newly developed skills and ask all of us to operate outside of our traditional comfort zones in the care of our patients. Our path here at Beth Israel Leahy Health to collaborative care started in 2012 with a grant and a partnership with an insurance provider to increase integrated behavioral health services into the primary care space. It's very common for many programs like this to start by having some outside foundational or grant support. Over the next two years in our own journey, we were able to obtain some additional internal research funding that allowed further expansion to add additional sites and additional providers to do this work. But at that point, we were still only really providing co-located care. It was not integrated or collaborative care. We continued to gain some traction with this type of model, though we were not yet fully a collaborative, as I mentioned. And then by 2017, we had secured some additional external grant funding to further expand those efforts. And you can see where we were in terms of the number of practices and personnel that we had on board at that time. And then by 2019, we were at seven practices providing general behavioral health integration with the addition of consulting psychiatric case review and looking more like collaborative care, but not yet there. In 2019, 
we formed a brand new health system here in Massachusetts called Beth Israel Lakey Health that combined several older health institutions together and created a very large network of primary care practices. And when this came together and we formed this new health system, we had an opportunity to really enhance and make a definitive commitment to collaborative care as a form of care that we wanted to provide. But as you can see here, left to our own devices, we implemented about one practice per year on average in the preceding seven years. This new health system was gonna include over a hundred primary care practices. So we were going to need to accelerate and scale any potential intervention. We created a project team as a collaboration between primary care and psychiatry to really drive this change and engage this new system leaders into this process. We really leveraged the good work that was already in place in different parts of our system and created a governance and an operational structure that would support this implementation and ongoing management over time. But getting buy-in from leadership isn't as easy as it sounds. We certainly had key stakeholder support from primary care, behavioral health, our system integration team, and clinical leaders, but nothing was certain. And you can really see here kind of what that evolution looked like from beginning in an early stage around design teams to getting uh, executive support and buy-in, convening different teams, creating a project implementation plan, and lastly, leading it to where we are today, where we had to establish governance, operations, implementation, and eventual refinements. We really worked through this process to identify key levers of influence for the new system and help to gain buy-in. So our health system was focusing on population health and cost containment as a very key driver to what it would do differently in this environment here in Massachusetts. And so we presented these data that document the multiplicative cost of care for individuals with comorbid medical and behavioral health conditions. And you can see that for those individuals that have comorbid conditions, the cost of care is multiplicative in terms of four to seven times the usual cost of care. We leverage data from national groups that have been doing collaborative care to understand large system financial drivers. These are data from a large public insurance group in the upper Midwest of the US. And what we see here is that the majority of expense that is related to the care of individuals with an identified mental disorder is actually the medical expenses of caring for their health conditions rather than expenses directly related to the treatment of their mental disorders. So here, health systems are spending more money to care for their medical problems than they are their psychiatric or mental health needs. And you can see that as a larger proportion of the cost in the lower parts of the, each of those columns and bars, which represents the physical health claims costs as compared to the upper bars, uh, which represent the mental health or substance use disorder claim costs. And so to highlight some of the other important factors as to why we should do this, besides it being and providing state-of-the-art treatment for our patients, but these are data from that original impact study I showed with you on the cost savings associated with an implementation. They put together all the outpatient costs to include emergency department visits, physical therapy and other therapies, medical and surgical subspecialty costs. And they found that for every dollar spent to execute collaborative care, the system saved an additional $6 in reduced healthcare utilization costs. So there was a return on investment of approximately six fold, which is a helpful driver for systems as they think about trying to contain costs. And if the financial incentives weren't enough, collaborative care was a positive driver for provider and patient satisfaction, another key metric for the new health system. These are materials from the AIM Center Washington, which has really led the world in doing this work and describing the benefits of collaborative care. And you can see that beyond having an established evidence base, it leads to better medical outcomes. It helps with challenging cases. It can be improve implementation and fast clinical improvement. And it really brings teams together. Similarly, our data and implementation at that point had demonstrated a 95% patient and provider satisfaction with the type of work. So eventually we were able to obtain leadership buying for collaborative care because it deploys a model of care that has been built and can be scaled throughout a system. It provides enhanced behavioral services for over a half a million patients that we care for across our primary care network. 
It draws on already established significant institutional experiences in our new health system, and there continues to be a strong empirical evidence base for this clinical efficacy around patient outcomes and provider satisfaction. And so with the new system setting this as a standard, we would create and define the culture and expectation moving forward. But we needed to make a further transition from that co-located care that we had been provided to full collaborative care. And in making our case to leadership, we were specific about collaborative care because of the evidence base as opposed to other forms of behavioral health intervention in the primary care space. We recognize that other components of our health system, like our community health centers, our affiliated hospitals, or some other practices, had already had successful collaborative teams that were effective. But when we, when we considered a scalable, broad intervention that was going to target primary care sites without experience in integrated care, collaborative care offered the most robust clinical, financial, and sustainability evidence to support its expansion and scalability. So as I mentioned, we had groups doing various forms of integrated care. However, the data have shown that not all integration is the same. As compared to co-location of psychiatric services and primary care, collaborative care offers a greater reduction in depressive symptoms and increased achievement of remission. This helped us to also get some partners who may not have been practicing collaborative care to consider a transition to collaborative care. And so when we think about collaborative care, these are those core elements of success and really what separates it from other forms of integration. It's also the consistent application of these principles that creates the environment for collaborative care to be successful. And these skills often new challenge all members of the care team to work outside their traditional comfort zones. Change is hard and change in healthcare may even be harder. I spent the past moments describing what it took to convince leadership about a clinical intervention that already had over a hundred randomized controlled trials to support its use. Nevertheless, once committed to change, we needed to actually put that into action. So to date, we've done implementation with the willing and not been overly rigorous with our partners or had a prioritized way to accomplish our integration efforts. So we set out to identify champions for this effort and in individual practices. We were deliberate in this new model that it was going to be a joint venture between psychiatry and primary care with support from the new health system. And we sought early adopters with experience and successful change implementations. So many practices were eager to partner around the care of patients with mental health needs. But this model of care is different, and it's going to require changes to clinical practice, to workflows, and to share decision-making that not every practice was ready for. In addition, it recognizes that this service isn't just going to appear in a practice and run. The practice and its providers are going to have some work to do, too. And so our champions and our leaders were out in front at practice meetings early and often to share plans, upcoming initiatives, do trainings, anything to keep the effort top of mind and engage practices. And though we were small at the beginning, we really designed our system for where it was going. So we created an executive steering committee that was comprised of system level leadership, behavioral health care leadership, and primary care leadership. These pioneering members were pivotal in getting the continued buy-in and setting long-term goals for us. We created an operational team that would actually do the work of implementation. And as you can see, it had broad representation from the many aspects of healthcare delivery that included primary care, psychiatry, finance, operations, population health, contracting, and includes our program directors that oversee the practices. At the outset, we set to create a playbook on implementation that, and align our practices as we were working across multiple historic business units, all with different contractual relationships and different electronic health records. But we wanted a process that was repeatable and able to be executed. We created specific tracks to define operational needs and drew upon pre-existing experience to create those systems and those pathways. And we built in time with our implementation, we built time in to our implementation plan to allow us to do this planning and upfront work, roughly about nine months from the start. And so here's a traditional timeline of adoption of any new technology of change. And I've overlaid, overlaid our timeline of implementation. And as you see, it was about seven years we only added about a practice per year. And if we were going to achieve what we set out to do as a new health system, we were going to need accelerators. And creating a working manual was a part of that acceleration plan. So when we offer a new service, many practices will raise their hands to be first in line to receive that service. But as I mentioned, transition to collaborative care is a change in practice and culture. Not everyone is prepared to do that. So we set about to assess the relative readiness of practices for change and use tools that were available to us to make those assessments. And you can see here some of those domains of information that we were after. 
ultimately the goal was to prioritize those early adopters who could successfully transition into collaborative care and then become champions and further help accelerate the work with their peers. This is a process map which outlines all the steps and touch points from starting in collaborative care to finish. We share this with every practice we meet to emphasize that it is going to take a village to be successful and that every member of the care team, from front desk staff to back office personnel to the providers and clinicians, all have a role to play in this being successful. And as I mentioned, we work in five different electronic health records. And so this was a template that each of those individual records will eventually allow us to harmonize those workflows or practices as we merge into a single electronic health record. And so with all this in place, we were able to accelerate our efforts by orders of magnitude and grow exponentially since coming together as a system, such that in the span of three years, we've now added over 50 practices. To this point, we've addressed kind of culture change and change management to drive successful implementation, but cost is always there, if not outright, but in the background. Unfortunately, collaborative care has several adaptable mechanisms to support its implementation. When implementing collaborative care, there are going to be expenses and revenues, and I've listed them there on the slides so you can see, both in startup costs and also in maintenance costs. But regardless of implementation, the expenses are going to be relatively the same. They're just scaled depending on the size of your implementation, and eventually there may be likely economies of scale that are created with larger implementations. Revenue tends to be supported through the direct clinical work, and it can either be episode-based payments or fee-for-services. That's a traditional payment model here in the U.S., but as a an opportunity for global episode billing that collaborative care gives us, we can leverage kind of population health and care in order to drive revenue as a different stream than fee for service. And as a joint venture of psychiatry and primary care, it's important to ensure that the revenue or any cost savings from implementation are routed back to the program to continue to fund its operations and expansion. And so the cost can be measured in many ways beyond just kind of financial dollars and cents. And we've built an iterative process to continually evaluate performance on sites in the collaborative care model. We've created regular dashboards for our operational team to review with their sites about how they're doing. We engage in regular open dialogue with our practices to hear where they are in their process and to get their feedback to improve it over time. And these spotlights of individual practices and providers continue to allow us to ensure that we have the right proportion of support in the practice and can make those adjustments over time. As we continue to grow the program, we have long-term goals that align with other metrics and outcomes important to our system and its components. Looking at our usual guideposts of patient care, population health, reducing costs, and improving provider experiences, we have aligned our operational efforts to make impacts on those specific measures that can include other process measures like engagement and referrals and outcome measures like achieving remission or medication adherence and improving patient and provider satisfaction. And so we built all of our tools to be able to measure these over time. Our future is always uncertain, but when we, th we think we have built a model for success and sustainability, our biggest test to date has probably been the pandemic. These are data from the CDC that have showed huge rises in rates of anxiety and depression and reductions and disruptions to available services. It also highlighted the transitions that underwent to telehealth. And collaborative care was built with telehealth in mind. So moreover, we continued to be able to onboard practices during the pandemic, such that during a time when community services continued to decline, we were able to actually increase access to behavioral services in the primary care space. Unfortunately, the evidence base for collaborative care continues to grow. We prioritize individuals with depression and anxiety into collaborative care at this time, but we will continue to incorporate new evidence-based models within collaborative care that address more psychiatric conditions and include other sites outside of primary care over time. And you can see some of where that established and emerging evidence actually is now with collaborative care. This has been a tremendous experience and something that I am very proud of being a part of, but it cannot be done alone. And it has required a committed group of individuals to see it through. I'm lucky to come share this with you today, but this really represents the work of so many people who have and continue to make this possible. And so with that, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to share our experience and hope that it uh, lights you to go and seek this opportunity of change and implementing in your own communities and in your own health systems. So thank you.